Welcome everyone to the fourth episode in this series of Inspiring Psychologists Breaking the Mold of Private Practice. I'm your host, Wendy Kendall, a psychologist and private practice coach. Today's episode is a vital one, titled Resilience and Growth, the intersection of entrepreneurship and mental health in private practice. Joining us for this enlightening conversation are three esteemed clinical psychologists who've carved their unique paths as entrepreneurs in private practice. Dr. Hannah Bryan, founder of the EMDRsupervisor.com. Dr. Tina Mystery, founder of the Brown Therapist Network and Dr. Tess Brown, founder of The Mind Atelier and drtessbrown.com. Today, we are taking a deep dive into a topic that affects all of us in private practice, the demands it places on our mental, physical and emotional health. In private practice, we wear many hats, juggle multiple responsibilities and the pace can be intense. And even with our best efforts, burnout, compassion fatigue and illness can still occur. My biggest takeaway from this conversation, and something I hope resonates with all of you, is how critical it is to design our practices with our mental, emotional and physical health as the bedrock. Self-care isn't just a nice to have, it's foundational to our success and well-being. Towards the end of our conversation, we'll explore what that looks like in practice and some of the tactics may surprise you. This episode is a must listen for psychologists and therapists seeking to grow their practice, particularly if you're worried about potential overwhelm or if you face burnout in the past. Before we dive in, I want to extend an invitation to all our listeners to join us in the Inspiring Psychology Practices Facebook group. It's a space where you can share and bounce around ideas for growing your private practices. You can also connect with us on LinkedIn or visit our website at inspiringpsych.com. That's inspiringpsych.com for more resources. Thank you for tuning in and let's jump into this essential conversation. Hello and welcome to episode four of the Inspiring Psychologist Breaking the Mold of Private Practice podcast. And um, we are also going live right now on LinkedIn. And uh, in a moment, I'm going to be uh, introducing my guest today. Um, But this I just want to have a word about this topic as well, because um, looking at the intersection of entrepreneurship and mental health in private practice, I always say that being in private practice is one of the most um, emotionally confronting opportunities available to us. Um, And so I really feel like um, a lot of us come into private practice Um, from environments that may not have been conducive to our mental health. And there are really real opportunities to create healing environments for ourselves. And yet at the same time, you know, wherever I go, there I am. We we still have to um, work with ourselves to, you know, to help our mental health and so on. Um, Plus, obviously, as psychologists in private practice, we're often supporting other entrepreneurs in their uh, businesses. So I'd love to um, welcome to the podcast my guest for today. That's Dr. Tess Brown, Dr. Tina Mystery, who is joining us again, and Dr. Hannah Bryan. Uh, And these are all um, some of my favorite people in the world, I have to say. I do enjoy working with all of you. (laughs) Um, So yeah, um, Coming to all of you, I just wanted to give you an opportunity, first of all, to introduce yourselves. Um, 
so maybe starting with Tina, if that's all right. I just mentioned that um, that you or we already saw Tina and met Tina in um, episode two of this podcast. But I really <laughs> wanted to get you back here, Tina, to talk about this intersection of um, mental health and private practice. So please just uh, give a bit of an in intro to who you are and, and um, in this context of helping entrepreneurs uh, with their mental health. Yeah, sure thing. So I'm Tina Mystery. I am a trained clinical psychologist. Um, I'm the founder of the Brown Therapist Network, which is a community. It's a network space where South Asian therapists from across the globe come together and connect. And this is a particular you know, passion of mine to support people who are navigating through the mental health context of working within systems that sometimes can be wearing, you know, on practitioners. So that's one area that we definitely look at for sure. Yeah, perfect. Thank you for that. And I think also um, recently some of the posts that I've spotted from you on LinkedIn have been around the intersection of um, um mental health in cybersecurity startups. I know this was something that we've had a really interesting conversation about. Yeah, absolutely. It's an area that I think is definitely emerging and, and we can see it across all different sectors, right? We can talk about healthcare sector, we can talk about our doctors, we can talk about nurses, we can talk about midwives, we can talk about these um, specific professionals or populations that work in what we would class as high stressful jobs and how important it is to put their mental health as a, a conversation as something that we need to be forward planning and thinking about because I think what I'm seeing across the uh, within the business space is well-being and well-being washing and actually what that looks like in, in real terms, when I was working in the UK as a, a psychologist, was I was working with a lot of professionals who were burnt out by the systems that they were working within. And this could be, you know, consultants working in, you know, the big four, or it could be doctors, nurses and teachers. So I see how these systems actually often aren't supporting, you know, people that are working mm. in these type of environments. And cybersecurity is one of them that is equivalent to, you know, somebody who is working in a high stressful, high emergency situation. Yeah, yeah. yeah. In that kind of fast growth, fast paced, high risk uh, environment as well, I think that kind of exacerbates a lot of issues potentially. So coming to you now, Tess, um, and please give an introduction to yourself. Sure, thanks, Wendy. Um, so, um, like Tina, I'm also a trained clinical psychologist. Um, I am based in the UK now. Um, after a period of working overseas, um, I founded a private psychology practice called The Mind Atelier, um, which offers online therapy, coaching, um, and training services. Um, and a lot of what I do, a lot of the, the work I focus on is with people um, in the business space, entrepreneurs, um, business owners, um, and a lot of the work that we're focusing on is either around um, coming back after burnout or preventing burnout. So um, yeah, this topic is something that's sort of very close to my heart, both professionally and also personally as a business owner as well. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. And um, it really struck me as well, because you spent a, a long time or, you know, a period of several years also working in Hong Kong in that environment and supporting mm. people in that kind of, you know, high, what, what we might consider to be a highly entrepreneurial environment as well, right? And quite demanding and so on. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, um, yeah, so I've, I've, I feel like I've seen both ends of this. I've seen it when um, people can really flourish in um, entrepreneurship and really create a business that um, is built around their mental health sometimes as the main priority, um, but also the other end of that spectrum as well, um, where work is kind of the, the key stressor that's having a negative impact on, on a person's mental health. So yeah, yeah. It's, uh, yeah, it's a really important topic. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Tess. And Hannah, last but not least, um, could you introduce yourself, please? Can you hear us, Hannah? 
I think we might have some delays and lags in your feed. Hi, my Wi-Fi is dropping out a bit, so I'm only catching. So apologies, uh, I'm not hearing everything. Um, I'm I'm Dr. Hannah Bryan, same as Tina and Tess. I'm trained and qualified as a clinical psychologist. Um, can you not hear me? Uh, I think there's a there's a lag, and so. Um, you were just catching up with us and I think that may be just where it came through and I said can't hear you Hannah <laughs> or can you hear us so just carry on with your introduction <laughs> we'll get there okay 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 so yep yeah, um Dr Hannah Bryan I'm a clinical psychologist um worked for many years in mental health services for the NHS and now I'm full-time in private practice focusing mainly on working um using EMDR I'm also an EMDR consultant and facilitator really passionate about that approach I'm really passionate about helping business owners helping people um, entrepreneurs with their mental health similar to what I picked up Tess was saying earlier as well about how it's such a you know an important personal journey as well as uh, being hugely active in the businesses that we work with so yeah that's me yeah, and I know one of the things in particular that I've seen that you've been developing, you know, when I look at your LinkedIn content and so on, is around the um, using EMDR, which is a very particular kind of therapy to help people with performance blocks as well. Yeah. And I know that was a, a little bit of an innovation on your behalf as you were kind of progressing in your EMDR practice, right? Yeah, exactly. It came from a place of um, feeling quite burnt out and quite tired by um, a lot of really difficult stories that we hear in private practice and a lot of trauma work that we do. And I kind of felt like I need something a bit more lighter. You know, I still love doing that work and want to do that, but I don't think it's good to do too much of that all of the time. So I was trying to find a different way of thinking, how can I use my psychology? How could I use my EMDR to work with something that's not necessarily about the deep traumas and the really deep psychological symptoms but perhaps something a bit more about well-being and a bit more about how can we get people to function at the best and how can we get people to um you know step into a different version of themselves and be able to be different in the world so that came from some of the TPPA work yeah. with, that, that I've done with yourself yeah yeah and what you raised there Hannah is a really interesting point which is about also you know, as, as Tina and Tess have both alluded to, the impact of the kind of work that we do within our private practices and how focusing mainly in areas where on a daily basis somebody in their, in their job, in their role, may be dealing with um, distressing or distressed people um or you know distressing topics and or distressed people over time actually there's a need to uh, it's one of those things that I see really driving people to want to diversify their own private practices because it can just be too much on an ongoing basis as from a human point of view and I'm just wondering what are some of your experiences Tina I don't I think this might be something that you can relate to as well 100 percent yeah um so my my story is similar to you know most clinical psychologists trained in the uh, national health service um, and then I kind of pivoted to different sectors. So I've worked in education, I've worked in charities, I've done a lot of trauma work. So I was working um, for a period of time with victims who had homicide, you know, uh, within their families. So, you know, trauma is pretty much part and parcel of what I have just developed a specialist niche in. Um, I worked in brain injury. So again, trauma's there. And then, you know, I kind of continued even on within my private practice that trauma was a, a hugely prevalent issue um, because I was mainly working with, you know, burnt out, stressed out 
professionals that were being traumatized by the system and Mm -hmm. then I then started to niche a bit more and I worked predominantly with South Asian people now South Asian people have different layers of trauma so they could have you know kind of generational trauma intergenerational trauma as we call it and these are the topics that just kept coming up and you know when it when you're constantly being pulled in this direction and when it feels quite close to the things that you might have experienced as a human being, I feel like that that's when you start to feel like, actually, this needs to change, this needs to shift. Um, And that was the point for me, you know, especially during the pandemic where I felt like, oh my gosh, this is too much. Like we're already dealing with COVID. People have got all these issues. I'm trying to deal with, you know, my own issues. And then we've got these, you know, and I'm sitting with these very heavy topics that keep coming up and are, are exacerbated by the fact that, you know, people want to talk about trauma. All of a sudden it became this really cool topic. Um, and it just got to a point where I just thought, actually, I need to take care of myself. And that's when I decided to just take a step back from that piece of work. Yeah, yeah. And pivoting through that as well. Um <clears throat> So, Tess, I know that some of the discussions we've had, uh, that you've also been um, asked and you've been developing a service around supporting the mental health of people in private practice. Um, Mm. And so I think it sounds as though this might be something you've come across as well, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Both professionally and in the people that I've kind of coached and and supervised um, and worked with um yeah I think for me um my sort of passion in this topic came because I so I kind of ended up working in private practice because at the time I I was working for the NHS and in a specific trauma role actually so it it was just a part-time job so you know bills necessitate the fact that I needed to earn a little bit of extra money and it was a very conscious decision actually not to do my private work in trauma so that I was doing something a little lighter. it didn't always work out that way but that was kind of the intention um and then with a subsequent move over to Hong Kong um I was kind of forced to go into private practice full-time at that point because um, I don't speak Chinese fluently enough to work within the public health system there. Um, and so that's kind of where I started working privately. But I definitely remember a point where I felt, yeah, I just could, I could feel like I was starting to feel quite burnt out. I started to notice some of those symptoms of compassion fatigue with some of the clients that I was working with. Um, and actually, like Tina, this was also around the time of covid Um, and the pandemic but I also think for me it was timing in that I think I'd been feeling this way for a while I'd had I then had sort of two maternity leaves quite close to each other so that gave me a little bit of respite but then coming back from my second maternity leave with no further maternity leaves part of the plan um, I just felt like something needs to change in order to make my business sustainable and to make this this career of mine like long term and healthy for myself um so that was really the point for me where I I decided that something had to change and and that's where I put a few a few things in place really um Mm. and for me the things that I put into place were things like um well one of the things that I had noticed was that I felt like I was kind of plateauing I guess, unlike when I worked for the NHS and there would be appraisals and there would be lots of opportunities for career development and um, even promotions and so forth. When you're working for yourself, you don't really have that. Um, And so I kind of had to create my own uh, way of advancing. So for me, what that looked like was actively working towards my EMDR accreditation. Um, which is actually where I met um, Hannah (laughs) because she became my supervisor who supported me through that process Um, but that was really key part for me in terms of preventing burnout burnout and keeping me passionate about what I was doing because I felt like I was actually working towards something I felt like there was a goal at the end of it um, which felt really really important to me Um, and then I did a few other things like I niched down I, I was seeing quite a broad spectrum of clients before I sort of niche down to focus on working with clients um, that I particularly enjoyed or particularly felt skilled at. I switched my schedule around to make it work around other aspects of my life that are important to me, like exercise and spending time with my family and and those sorts of things. Um, 
And really through doing that, and I guess sharing a bit about that journey on social media, I then had more and more clinicians kind of contacting me um, for sort of coaching um, and mentorship opportunities um, because they could see that that's how I'd evolved. And I guess they wanted to some guidance on how they might do that that as well. Um, So that's really where it, it kind of began. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I'm just thinking about some of the aspects of my own journey in this area. I remember when I first went into private practice, and I alluded to this in the introduction, which was I was definitely exiting a toxic environment. And there was definitely an element of it. I mean, I moved countries as well. I don't I don't know that it was, I don't know if it was the same for you, Tina, but I definitely felt as though this was a positive move. I was moving to a new country, but I was definitely exiting a place that had not been great for my mental health. Mm-hmm. And um, I know that that disruption and that going into my own business um on the one hand was incredibly liberating because it felt as though, you know, it was up to me to create something that was good for for me, but it was incredibly confronting as well because now it's up to you and it's Mm -hmm. down to you. And, And then that sense of, kind of sense of overwhelm, you know, there's always that sense of a, a fine balance between growth and overwhelm and just always somehow playing on that that edge um moving to france also meant that i was you know moving to a place where i had to develop a professional identity um a new professional identity that that you know psychologue du travail work work psychology in France is not the same profession as it is in the UK or maybe in you know as an IO psychologist in the in the um, USA um and so there wasn't really a word to describe what I what I did and as well as that I just I didn't kind of gel with the idea of doing therapy in my second language which is interesting um, you know, thinking about Tina, for example, the people you work with and the availability of therapists in home languages, basically, mm-hmm. in first languages is, you know, there's not necessarily that level of diversity in in a lot of countries. So I ended up creating, a, 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 I think, a CBT-based um, self-study program for myself. I was my own guinea pig. And that was really, as you mentioned, um, Tet, it was a way that I could flex my business around my own needs. In fact, I think it might have been you, Tina, who kind of mentioned that, that it's, you know, that having your own business and <clears throat> those opportunities as well. Um, yeah. So when you think about kind of this topic of resilience and growth and mental health ship and entrepreneurship, um, what br- really kind of brings it home for for you as to why it's so important and maybe coming to you Hannah because I know that um you know I think this story has lots of layers for you as well perhaps yeah I th- it's it's really interesting and you know this this idea of resilience is something that I don't know I feel similar that I want to kind of pull away from thinking that we want everybody to be really resilient because you know that puts the onus all on us and I can remember at my interview for my doctorate in clinical psychology that we really had to talk about how resilient we were and how we like weren't too troubled by anxiety or depression and how you know we were we were you know just not not normal human beings really you know so nothing's ever happened I can cope with anything just throw it at That's me I'll wild that it. that was at the doctorate interview mm, that they that were was, like gatekeeping at that level that's how I experienced it that's how I felt so I think I spent such a lot of time in my career thinking um that, that it was this division, that it was us as clinical psychologists that perhaps have all the knowledge to help people with the mental health. And then there's all those people out there that need help with the mental health. Um, and, you know, it just sounds ridiculous when I say that out loud now, because when I think back to my journey, when I started to struggle with my own mental health, had a lot going on in my life. My sister was diagnosed with a terminal illness. I was in a toxic mm-hmm 
place of work. There wasn't much support. I started to not feel right. It just, um, yeah, it wasn't a really good time. But it took me a long time to realise, you know, my mental health's good, not good. I've got to do something about this, um, which has then led to this whole journey that I've been on over the last four or five years, which has just been like amazing really when I look back but it just fascinates me that even though I'm a clinical psychologist even though I work in mental health all the time I was still from this perspective that we couldn't really experience these difficulties that are just part and parcel of being human um so now I like think about it the other way around really and you know everybody has these issues no matter where you are or the experiences that you've been and it's normal to have them but we can find ways of um of of coping and different ways to be which we were never encouraged to do so when I think now how I treat myself as my own boss in private practice you know I do so much stuff for my well-being you know I journal every day I meditate I never did that when I was working for somebody else I have a spa um session as regular as I can and it's all these things that you know are keeping me mentally well enough and then the knock-on effect of that this is where I think it tra- ties to entrepreneurship is that I know you know most of the time I'm more creative I come up with new ideas I could work much better whereas before it was like no work 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 shuff down what you're feeling and just keep going so I think well I can't have been working very well really compared to what yeah. I feel that I deliver and produce now yeah 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 I feel like um we bring there is there is the risk that we bring those ex I've said it before those extractive ways of working you know work ourselves to the bone work all the hours um God sends don't take enough holidays all those things that would be you know really um <laughs> I think for a lot of a lot of companies would kind of get ticks in the boxes, you know, highly dedicated, et cetera. Yeah. And um, sometimes we bring those into our own businesses as well and uh, kind of set up a, a culture around that and which then gets celebrated too. So coming over to you, Tess and mm-hmm. Tina, do any of those facets um, kind of resonate with your own experiences and why this is kind of an important area for you as well? Jump in. Um, yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Should I jump jump in there? Um, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I just think I just think they're so interlinked, aren't they? Kind of entrepreneurship and your mental health. And I think you know, as as you've all sort of mentioned, a lot a lot of people um, will move into setting up their own business because they're trying to escape some of the stresses um, and some of the consequences of those stresses that they might be experiencing when they're working for somebody else. Um, but of course being a business owner brings its own stresses and its own sense of overwhelm as well. And I think there's a balance, isn't there, in that you can create a business uh, which prioritizes your mental health um, and facilitates you to do the things which are going to nurture your mental health, like making time to journal or or go to the gym um, or finish at a time when you can pick up your kids if that's important to you or whatever the thing is. Um, But also, I think being a business over all being a business owner also kind of puts you at risk or vulnerabilities to other sources of stress and overwhelm um because you know for example like I find it hard to switch off because Mm -hmm. it's it's my business there's always more I could be doing to Mm -hmm. the business and in the business to, to help it to thrive um and so I think you have to be really conscious and really intentional about setting and upholding those boundaries which mean that you can get that balance right between running a successful business but also managing successful sort of healthy mental health at the same time um and I think it's a constant it's a it's a constant not a battle necessarily but a it's it's a it's a constant issue to keep coming back to because it just ebbs and flows and you know week in day in there'll be different different pressures that leave you feeling more burnt out or more rested and so forth um but I think personally one of the huge advantages I find of 
of having my own business is that I'm the one making those decisions Mm. actually so if I do notice that I am beginning to notice symptoms of burnout or you know if my partner mentions that I'm you know working into the evenings or you know a bit a bit more snappy then I can consciously make a choice to create a change to pull back from that in a way that when you're working for somebody else you don't have that Mm -hmm. um that freedom to do that I think that's really powerful and for me that's something that sense of that kind of control is something for me that I I really really like and it makes me feel like I've got more control of my mental health as well because I could do that yeah yeah it just strikes me that sometimes I had I remember having this experience where I I literally had an internal negotiation about booking my own holidays and you know when you were in a job and you had to fill in a sheet I don't know if you ever had to do this but you had to fill in a sheet right to say oh I'm going to book some time off in these days and there was always that little thing of do you think my boss is going to let me do that Mm. like how much of a jerk is my boss (laughs) and when you're having a conversation with yourself about how much of a jerk is your boss (laughs) in your own business (laughs) (laughs) that's maybe when we start to think about okay how do we help that part of ourselves that is being a bit of jerk to the rest of the inner leadership team in this business to maybe renegotiate how they show up in that role (laughs) but it can be really hard because we do have those kind of inner driving inner striving Mm -hmm. inner critic (laughs) And I feel like in entrepreneurship, because there is such a, there's actually a closer link between the results we see in the business and the activities we do as an individual. Mm. It's not a perfect one-to-one link. You know, we don't just put Mm. an hour of effort in and immediately see, you know, a a bunch of payoff. Um, But I feel like compared to enormous organizations in particular, there's a much closer link. And in that sense, we can find some of the kind of, you know, high striving, um, high demanding, those kinds of things that in a, in a, um, in a, a bigger organization might be called, uh, you know, toxic culture, that we might get into some of that and, and, and we'll be getting the payoff for it as well in life and I really loved what you said Tina about how about we build a business that supports our mental health first and foremost Mm. what would that look like and coming to you Tina because I'm also mindful that you made that big life shift around some of this as well so that must have kind of that must have been a, a really kind of interesting experience for you yeah, I mean, the reason we came out here wasn't wasn't because of me and because I'd had enough um, of the UK. It was um, obviously a family decision. It was my husband who actually got great opportunities to come out here. Um, but I guess just wanted to pull on something, actually, because I think one of the things that when I was looking at private practice many, many years ago, my fear was around the isolation and the impact mm-hmm. of being isolated without a team. And that's one thing when, when you know, as you were talking, Tess okay. and um, Hannah, was that when I reflect back at my first private practice in 2016, 17, it was, I didn't realize how bad I felt without having people around me. You know, I was kind of just drilling into this private practice world, thought it was right for me, and it was right for me. But I think the 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 sort of fantasy is that you you know, you you think that everything will be fine, but actually it's really important to have the right people around you as well. And I know that, you know, a lot of discussions you, you will have as, as clinical psychologists who are working within teams is their biggest fear is that isolation part and how heavy a toll that is that can have on your mental health. So I, I just kind of wanted to kind of raise that really in terms of there's a risk of that and there are actually remedies to that which you know Wendy was that part of that remedy for me you know creating a space creating mentorship and coaching and having people around you as well and that's one thing that I've learned as I've gone on really is that that's important people yeah yeah Mm. you know that really that's such a superb point to remind us all of because I remember when I 
left my job and came into private practice, I'd had five psychologists working for me, two admin staff. And I felt, you know, I felt there was a certain identity of of mm. kind of leading and managing a team like that. And then going to having nobody working with you, uh, as you said, Tina, I was, I didn't even realize I did, you were far ahead of the game on me. I was like, no, it'll be absolutely fine. It'll all be, you know, stress free because I'll only have myself to sort out. I had not recognized how much I needed and wanted and enjoyed and loved having people around me to work with me. Mm. And not, uh, you know, working with clients is awesome. Work, you know, going and getting on airplanes and going seeing people is fabulous. But actually the day-to-day of having a coffee in the kitchen with someone or um, walking to wherever to get your lunch and, and sitting down over lunch with people. And I think that was, that's been part of the thing that people really missed in the pandemic as well, right? All those kind of mm-hmm. social relationships got disrupted. And now also looking at hybrid and remote models of working. I know that I was doing a piece of work with a, a big European organization around their remote and hybrid work models. And they were describing how Um, you know, the deep work was being done at home. When they came into the office, they were all trying to get meetings in with one another to work on work topics. And the thing that got left out of these hybrid and remote models was the little bits of socializing, the little bits of relationship building that were not at all work related. So like, all the kind of we need to be together to work on this topic and do the collaborating stuff was being jammed into that one or two days of working in the office together. And everyone had kind of forgotten about the social, you know, let's go Mm -hmm. and get half an hour or an hour at lunchtime or let's just, you know, do this or we'll pass one another in the in the corridors and just spend 10 or 15 minutes because we've got a little bit of time. No one had time for that anymore. And it was really being kind of left out and lost um yeah so just throw that one in the mix for anyone to kind of respond to I don't know if you I don't know if you've kind of also experienced that or or come across any of those similar themes Mm. it feels like the connection is what is is at the heart of a lot of things and that's what Mm. we've missed out on and that can be a fear of um, entrepreneurs and people working in private practice not feel connected but I think you know that's a Mm. wonderful thing Wendy that you've created for a way for us all to connect and you know as as we started this call earlier I was saying I know Tess and, and yourself Wendy have worked a lot with them I don't I haven't actually worked with Tina, but because of the way that you've created the work, I almost feel connected to you through yeah. um, mm. discussions that we've had online and whatnot. So, mm. yeah, I think it is that, mm. um, that way of connecting with people that are doing similar things to yourself and might come up against similar challenges. And um, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm. I think one of the advantages in the sort of entrepreneur space is that um because I absolutely agree I think connection is is huge and and for me it's it's one of the pillars of my mental health so it has to therefore be part of the foundations of my business and how I run it if my mental yeah. health is gonna is gonna be good um one yes you do have to be I think more proactive and intentional about putting the effort into um, building those relationships and then maintaining those relationships in a way that you wouldn't necessarily if you were sharing an office with somebody or you would bump into them, you know, when you're making a coffee together in the pantry at work. Um, but I think one of the advantages is that you can choose your tribe. You can choose mm. which of those yeah, relationships that's you hold on to. <laughs> and so much work stress comes from toxic relationships in, in the occupational environment. Um and you can't walk away from those relationships when you're within a system working with people. Whereas um, on the main part, if you're you know, an entrepreneur, you can choose to build the really healthy connections and relationships with people that build you up, that make you thrive, that cheerlead you. And you can choose to distance yourself or remove yourself from the relationships which have the opposite effect. Yeah. And and I I think that working for myself has given me the opportunity to 
build connections with people and in ways that I wouldn't have done otherwise. Mm. Like through social media, for example, I, I have fantastic connections with people I've never, ever met in real life. Mm. Um, actually, you, you guys here, <laughs> like, I feel like I know, especially Wendy and Hannah, I know you really well, but we've never actually met in real life. But I've got, you know, friends uh, in Canada and America, people that I've collaborated with, but we've never actually met. But just the different you know the different avenues and where, where you can connect mm -hmm. and the different ways that you can connect can be really diverse um and that just speaks to me and speaks to my heart in terms of how I like to connect on a personal level and I don't think I would have been able to to do that in the way that I have if I was working within a within a system mm -hmm. yeah you know right I'm throwing a bit of a curveball in here folks because <laughs> <laughs> This is making me think about, so I, I know that one of the models that kind of really guides my, um, the way in which I think about supporting psychologists in private practice is the PERMA-V model. So Seligman and PERMA stands for, let me get this right, positive emotions, engagement, positive relationships, talking about here meaning achievement and the v got added on the end because it stands for vitality um and and you know i think a lot about those principles when i'm thinking about how i work with people but um the discussion you know coming back to this point about if we build businesses that are good for mental health then that's great but I'm wondering how that has also influenced um, the ways in which you've gone about supporting your clients. So, Hannah, for example, I know that this was something that was making you think about the application of EMDR and uh, uh, to coaching, for example, and you know helping people with performance blocks in mm -hmm. particular. Um, so, so that's an example, and I'd love to hear more about it. And I'm just wondering about that for you. Tina and for you Tess also about how has this journey of supporting your mental health in your private practice then influenced how you work with clients mm. so I'll, I'll leave Tina and Tess with the exam question for a moment <laughs> and I'm going to come to you <clears throat> Hannah because I know that we've had discussions about this shaping of EMDR for coaching especially for business owners mm -hmm. yeah so tell me yeah. a little bit about that kind of what the origin story of 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 that piece of work for you Hannah <laughs> yeah it's it's interesting when I look back on it now because it never felt like that at the time but when I you know when I was on this journey even though I was like two two and a half years into it when I kind of thought oh that's what I'm talking about you know yeah. anger, performance anxiety uh, mental health as business owners trying to get the best out of that person you know initially this was me and I think mm. that's that's what I see um as being the whole of what I'm kind of doing now with my business is creating something for somebody who is a, a younger version of me how I was like you know yes. when I come out off the NHS feeling burnt out and really wanted to prioritize myself and I was thinking you know oh you know really interested in EMDR and um and training to be a facilitator and then maybe delivering my own trainings but how can I do that you know I'm scared to death about standing up in front of people so you know I'll put in the work for that I started to work on my mindset work on my mental health work on my beliefs and you know do all these things so it feels like I've been the um the test case really yes. to see what I needed to do one. it to get right. me where I wanted Yes. wanted to be so yeah I find that just so fascinating and when I look back it feels like a linear journey and it was so obvious from day dot that this <laughs> was where I was going to end up but it's not it's you know it's all over the place and it, it was nothing like that I'm glad I've journaled through all these years because you can oh, yes. look back and see you know a snippet of an idea was planted then and then three months later it grew into something else mm. yeah so for me it's just been you know no matter how how 
slow we're moving, as long as we're still moving, as long as we're still prioritising um, ourselves, our mental health, what we love to do, because I felt that I'd come from um, an environment where I'd forgotten what this was. You know, I was conditioned yes. just to follow rules and do what other people expected of me. So it feels like I've had to, you know, try and get through all of that con- conditioning shut off by like normal way of thinking and just try and go a bit deeper and feel what's deeper inside what's more true to me what I am capable of and I always say I cannot believe the growth I know we talked about growth earlier in in um Mm. in the title here I cannot believe the growth that I've seen in myself from investing in myself investing in my mental health and doing what I love exactly. rather than yeah rather than trying to tick a box and do what somebody else is telling me to do and then because I'm there the knock-on effect that that's had with all of the people you know that I've worked with over the years whether it's coaches therapists um therapy clients or you know tests when we've gone through accreditation with the MDR I just feel that I'm really enthusiastic and passionate about what I do and that that ripple effect has a knock on effect on everybody that I work with. This is cool. I feel like we're building a manifesto for why mental health is so important to entrepreneurs, because actually how about the possibility that maybe just maybe we build better products and services when we actually prioritize the mental health of people leading (laughs) <laughs> small yeah. innovative businesses <laughs> yeah, funny exactly. that I know and it's just <laughs> it sounds so obvious doesn't it and I'm like because right. like, I get so excited about all the stuff that I do and what I create because I just love it and I never felt like that before before I used to put all this stuff at the center of everything that I did I never felt that way about what I was producing and delivering Mm, yeah yeah so and coming over to Tess and Tina now in in case of any kind of resonance where you've seen that kind of you know the prioritization of your mental health has then led to that more um positive kind of cycle of innovation in your own services Tina how about you yeah yeah so mine um is I resonate so much with what Hannah's been saying and so many threads that I wanted to pull on so the first bit for me was vulnerability and being self-aware those two pieces are so powerful especially Mm. within like our field that there's this there's a stigma right for us to not share how we Mm. genuinely feel or honestly feel and I think that that's something that I'm stripping back and and you know kind of saying you know what I like Hannah said we're human first before anything else and the more that we share our stories share our truths um the more then we inspire others to then do the same for themselves and The other piece around vulnerability and, you know, stripping back what is it meant to be to be a psychologist is that critical thinking. Like we're taught to be critical thinkers in terms of the research that we, you know, read and the papers and books and everything. But actually, you know, one of my biggest journeys has been around being critical around the field of psychology as a whole and the way that, you know, mental health is constructed. Mm. And again, just me putting those ideas out, reflecting on kind of where, where does my role then apply in this? It's inspired other people who I work with, coach, you know, to to really reflect on that piece of okay, what am I, what am I continuing, or what what am I kind of you know facilitating, or where am I in this whole thing, and then giving people the permission to almost stop and think about where do they want to go with this next? Because again, there is this lack of what feels like autonomy that we can be masters of our own you know careers and professions we we almost are somewhat um I guess guided or kind of you know we have this belief that we just follow and you know the the employers or the corporates or whoever we're working for they tell us how it's supposed to be done and then my second bit was really just about kind of in in the world of psychology and mental health there always seems to be that let's go to the past let's deal with the traumas let's deal with all the difficult stuff and especially within sort of my culture my community there's never really been about this coaching positive energy let's flip the script let's see what you know what what we as as human beings as a community have have harnessed and can provide and can continue to grow and provide you know I feel like that 
that that that conversation, especially within the Brown Therapist Network, has been really influential because it it's about kind of saying to people, yes, you can, not no, you can't. And and I think that that has been really powerful, I think, for sure. Yeah, yeah. And, and a topic that is coming up time and time again is about this power of reflection as well um, and how that actually can start to promote our sense of autonomy, meaning we start to question um the paradigms that we're moving within and then I me I see a a really clear link then with the potential for innovation Mm -hmm. um when we're not just following the way things have always been done and so it really seems like there's a very clear link there between supporting our mental health and actually being more innovative and being more more growth having more growth potential as small businesses as well Mm -hmm. and coming to you Tess I want to hear your perspective on this as well Um, Well, I I mean, sort of tapping into a couple of areas that both Hannah and Tina mentioned there, I guess, for me, I feel like um, my mental health journey or evolution or whatever you want to call it, um, has increasingly been been built around kind of my values and things that are most important to me. I I definitely think I personally begin to recognise and prioritise those things much more in the last sort of five years or so than probably earlier in my life. And therefore, I have built a business which honours those. Mm. And that's so intrinsic in the work that I do with my clients. And actually, I I guess I haven't made this kind of clear um, link before, but so much of the work that I will do with my clients is around their values and it's about what's important to them and it's about supporting them to (coughs) design a life which honours their values and is kind of shaped around their values as opposed to the patterns that they've sort of fallen into um and on Mm. reflection I see so much of that in my own journey and that you know the pathway towards clinical psychology and being a clinical psychologist was so sort of written out for you you have to jump through this hoop then this hoop this this hoop and then you go into this certain job and you you know you work through these bands it's all mapped out that it doesn't really give you the opportunity to pause and think well hang on is this is this mapping is this consistent with actually what's really important to me um and I guess for me ne- although it was really I feel like I almost got forced into um entrepreneurship because of the life decisions I made around moving abroad also with with my partner's work um but I'm so grateful that I kind of was forced to rethink that now because it has given me the opportunity to yeah design my work and my mental health in alignment with each other and now having moved back to the UK quite recently and having the opportunity to step back into the system that I left when I left the country, I made a very conscious decision to say, well, no, I don't want that. Actually, this mm. is too good. This, this life I've created, it's certainly not perfect, but, um, you know, I, it's, it's working well enough that I want to sort of stay in it. Mm. Um, and so, yeah, I think a lot of that sort of personal self-reflection journey shows up in the work I do with my clients um often unconsciously but it definitely does it definitely does and it's probably because I believe in it and I believe that yes. it can really be impactful mm. yeah yeah and in that sense there's a real kind of link with um the kind of authentic leadership then so you know you're in that in that way you're um offering possibilities to people and talking about visions of the future that and not just talk, you've lived them yourself and you've lived through them yourself. And so there's that brings a certain amount of authentic power to mm. how we show up in a in a leadership space as well. Then. Mm. Perfect. Mm. Now I'm mindful of time, even though I love getting into this topic with you. So what I'd like to ask each of you about is what are your hopes for the future of mental health and entrepreneurship? I'm gonna start with Tess first, if that's all right, and go the other way around to Tina and then Hannah. Um, I guess I just hope that it is higher up the agenda. Mm. I think I think as stigma breaks down, um, as more and more people are, are talking more openly, more humanly about their reflecting on their own mental health experiences, um, it does become uh, more highlighted and, and more sort of on the agenda. But I, I still certainly through the clients that I work with, um, it's not the case. 
um, everywhere. And so um, I love that we're having this conversation today because I think all of us are coming at it from a place where we're really keen to, mm. you know, make this more of the conversation and people who are kind of running their own businesses and supporting them in, in doing it that way. Um, and I guess I would I'd love to see that just be a more natural thing that, you know, and when people are thinking about their businesses, it's just intrinsic that we're also thinking about how can I shape this around my mental health physical health rather than just thinking about I don't know what's going to make me the most money it's also about what's going to make me successful in other areas Mm -hmm. you know where the true wealth lies um yeah I'd like to see more of that love it Tina hopes for the future yeah Yeah, I I mean exactly what Tess says it needs to be on top of the agenda from from education to you know even within our doctorate in clinical psychology Mm -hmm. we need that as part of you know we had one lecture on it self-care that wasn't enough it just wasn't enough it has to be more than that so I think that you know it, it and I think that th- there's <clears throat> got to be more conversation, honest, raw conversation, vulnerable conversations about these, you know, topics, because it looks very different for people. And, and it's about that, accepting that there's nuance as well and there's intersections. And, and it, we have to explore every element of that. Um, it's not an easy topic to confront. I think that when people hear the word mental health, I think they have all these images of what it looks like because of media and how they portray it. But actually... We, we just need to start from here and continue, you know, kind of flying that flag for, for mm. everybody. And, and it's a conversation yeah. for everybody. It's not just for us, the psychologists. Yeah. Mm. 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 Perfect. Thank you. Hannah, your hopes for the future. Yeah, <laughs> it, it, it's, it really links with um, a webinar that I delivered recently. And I think I chose the title something like Unlock Your Potential. You know, why it's important to look after yeah. your mental health as a business owner. Because I, I really do think that everybody sees it as separate and people don't see the connection with actually when we look after our mental health, you know, this magic stuff might might well happen. Um, so I think for me, it's people getting the connection and investing more in themselves um, around the area. And also, also seeing it and I keep talking about a journey which is um um you know but I see it that way that it's never ending almost I think we always used to see mental health as either you're well or not well and it was kind of you know that simple whereas I think you know this is a constant journey and I'll never stop being on this journey Mm. so yeah those are the two main things that I'm hoping for um as we move forward and keep on talking about these things because it's still not talked about in a lot of a lot of places is it yeah no you know I think the thing that I've really that's really occurred to me (laughs) I don't know if it should have occurred to me beforehand but it certainly has as a consequence of this conversation which is you know on that first day of people's MBA or you know the first day when you walk in on a business course about how to set up your own small business even um you know, setting up a business that aligns with your mental health should be the first, <laughs> the first day. Mm. It's not unaligned with making money. Ultimately, it's not unaligned with creating products and services that help other people and make other people's lives better. And by the way, it's likely to build sustainability right into the heart of your of your business. So, come on, let's get that on the first day <laughs> of these business courses. For goodness' mm. sake. On that note, you've made me realize as an occupational psychologist, which is all about mental health at work, we also didn't get lectures on how to look after your mental health in work. <laughs> Just what are we doing? Oh, my goodness. We're making, as you said, uh, we're making it all about other people. Okay, last bit. Thank you. Where can we find you? So, um, Tina, where do we find you? Sure. So, I hang out on LinkedIn now. That's my best. My best place that I am but I'm also on Instagram and also um on the Brand Therapist Network as well on Instagram as well awesome thank you for that Hannah where do we find you um I probably quite active on Instagram at the moment um I'm the EMDR psychologist and coach on Instagram um, and I also spend a bit of time on LinkedIn uh Dr Hannah Bryan on LinkedIn perfect thank you and last but not least Tess where do we find you online 
Um, I'm also quite active on Instagram at Dr. Tess Brown. Um, and then um, my website, uh, drtessbrown.com, is a, is a good place to go to sort of find out about me and, and the work I do as well. Perfect. Thanks so much for being here, everyone. Um, I hope uh, all of our listeners and uh, the folks watching us, if you're catching us live in the video podcast, are um, uh, enjoyed our conversations. Looking forward to getting into the comments. And uh, yeah, don't forget, if you enjoyed this conversation, then please share it with any of your uh, friends, loved ones or colleagues who you think might uh, enjoy it as well. Uh, see all of you next week both my guests I'll probably see you before then <laughs> but also uh, catch you all for the uh, podcast next week take care everybody and see you thanks for being here thank you thanks Wendy thanks. thanks I'd love to hear what you think about the inspiring psychologist podcast so please take a moment to leave a review and give us a rating wherever you listen to podcasts it makes a massive difference in helping us to reach new audiences. If, like me, you're feeling inspired and moved by the private practice stories in our podcasts, please spread the word across your own networks. And why not encourage your colleagues and friends to listen to the podcast too? To make sure you don't miss out on future episodes, please be sure to subscribe to the Inspiring Psychologist podcast. You can find out more about all my guests from Series 1 at our website, inspiringpsych.com. That's inspiringpsych.com.